Welcome, Welcome to the Moto Marketing Podcast, presented by Racer X, the podcast for moto industry professionals, entrepreneurs, and riders. If you want to grow your brand and business in today's digital first world, you have to know how to turn a stranger into a fan, turn a like into a customer. You have to know how to turn attention into dollars. This podcast is dedicated to keeping you in the know on real marketing tactics that work in the moto world so that you grow your business and help grow the sport. Get ready to learn from the very same marketing experts trusted by Racer X, Lucas Oil Pro Motocross, GNCC, and NBC Sports. They'll help you navigate the world of digital marketing for your moto brand. This is the Moto Marketing Podcast. Podcast. Presented by Racer X. All right, as uh, as promised, we got an exciting guest for you today. Welcome back to the show. First off, and welcome to the first official video show of the Moto Marketing Podcast. You might be listening to us on iTunes. Uh, I definitely encourage you to to come check it out on the Racer X YouTube channel as well, because we are officially. Uh, pumping out video now. We've got our first guest today uh, for the video show. We've got Andy White with FXR. I'm really excited to have him on today. Andy, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us, man. Thank you. Yeah, I know this is awesome. Uh, first one up on the video conference. This is cool. right. Yeah, we need to get you a plaque or something like that because obviously this is a big moment in history that so many people are going to care about. <laughs> but man, I am very excited. I, I did. I, we we busted our hump to get everything ready uh, specifically because I knew you were coming up, and it would have been easiest for us to just say, "Well, let's do another audio show." But I thought you would be a great first guest to bring on uh, on video because I'm I'm super intrigued with your story and the FXR brand story. Um, and, and kind of where you guys came from in the moto space. And obviously, for those that don't know, your uh, the FXR brand is rich in the, the, the snow market. But the last few years, FXR has really kind of come out of nowhere and, and popped on the scene. And now you're getting bigger and bigger and bigger riders in, in moto and supercross. And there's a reason behind that. So that's what I was hoping we uh, would talk about today. Before we dive into that, though, I would like for you to tell me a little bit about yourself. You said you've been with the company for five years. So what kind of how did you get involved in the moto space and how did it come to be with FXR? Uh, well, um, I, like every other writer or any other person in this industry, I, I feel we all came from a writing background and I raced um, as an amateur all the way up to pro class in Canada racing the Canadian Nationals, scoring lots of points and having lots of fun, sponsored by Honda and Yamaha Canada back in the day. And uh, then introduced to other people into the suspension uh, side of the business and owned a, a company called ProTech for 15 years with uh, my uh, business partner, Lee Tinkler. And we franchised our suspension company across Canada into New York State. Uh, we had five locations, so we got to meet a lot of people that way. And then we ended up buying a, a dealership here in Montreal um, called uh, Diablo Motorsports. And uh, we had Honda and KTM. And we hired riders like uh, Mike Treadwell, Keith Johnson to come up and race in Canada. We had Marco Dubé. Uh, we even uh, brought up John Dowd um, one year um, to, to compete. Uh, Suzuki was looking for somebody. And I seemed to somehow get uh, tagged into having to manage that program. So we brought John into the program and the whole thing kind of started that way for five years. I was running a, a Honda program, a Suzuki program in Canada. And then one day uh, KTM Canada called and they were looking for a, a race director to take over their whole Canadian program. And I thought, wow, this is a, a great opportunity. And um, I sold my, my uh, dealership and uh, my suspension part to my, uh, my partners and moved on to KTM Canada, which was connected to KTM USA. And I ran the uh, factory uh, Red Bull KTM program for 10 years uh, with Colton Fasciati, Dusty Klatt, Michael Willard. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. We had lots of championships, lots of great days. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And uh, I, I met, and learnt, uh, met and learned a lot in those 10 years. And uh, I got to work with the U.S. Uh, department uh, in a high level. And I, I learned a lot from those guys. And uh, I met a lot of media people and, and great people. And that's where I think it really helped 
when I jumped into the FXR program. Um, after 10 years with KTM, uh, I, I decided it was time for a new change and uh, I didn't connect right into FXR. I became a consultant for a bunch of companies and uh, FXR was one of them and they were really wanting to uh, get into the moto scene. They had been in moto a couple years before, but they didn't really put a solid effort. Uh, they, they dabbled here and there. Uh, the snow division is where the real dollars are. And uh, the owner, Milt Reimer, being a real passionate moto guy, felt that this was the time to get into the moto scene. And um, we connected and really started working together and uh, with his team and myself. And, and here we are five, late, five years later. So the, the, the growth where <laughs> I feel like every success story for the outsider, it seems like an overnight success story, but for the people in the know, it was an overnight success story that took years and years to get there. Talk to me about the, the first moves to really get into the marketplace and, and get the attention of, um, you know, let's just talk about the pro riders because the pro riders that are going to have your gear on, that's what's going to move it on uh, in the dealerships and with the amateur riders and online. So was that, did FXR leverage your expertise and knowledge in the industry to kind of seek out um, those, those privateers to begin with that would be a great fit for the brand? Or how, how did you guys start to make a name for yourself initially uh, five years ago with this push? Um, no secret. I, uh, I went into my uh, contact list and researched all the riders that I knew that might be interested and in, that could help me promote the FXR brand. And um, through a lot of channels and whatnot, uh, uh, we researched as much as I could to find the best bang for the buck. Um, we didn't have a lot of money back in 2015 to spend into the program, um, but I knew we had a decent product and we had a good marketing program behind it. So we knew Supercross was all eyes on Supercross every weekend. 50,000 people at the venue. Let's try and find a rider to three that will elevate us. And uh, Alex Ray was one of our first guys that we hired. And uh, I mean, he puts on a show wherever he goes. And even today, he's a showman. And uh, he really was one of the first guys. Him and uh, Keith Harrison um, were guys that really helped us uh, uh, get the name onto the, onto the stage of Supercross. And uh, in Canada, we ended up uh, supporting the Yamaha three Canadian team, and they signed up Jimmy Dakotas, and we got FXR on Jimmy. And uh, Jimmy, being well known in the U.S. and the media following the Canadian racing, and Jimmy from New England, it it just all started to snowball together, and um, that's how I think we f I feel we really got the name out there uh, from day one was connecting to really key riders that were very vocal, really strong on social media, and really helped us move it along. It's easy to throw banner ads and buy magazine ads, but um, you got to have a name to connect to those, uh, those, those advertising or those banners. And I think those guys really helped us out from day one. And then we just had a lot of new people contacting us and hitting us up and wanted to be the Alex Rays or the Jimmy's or whatnot. And, um, it, it, it's been a, a great ride and a lot of fun. I, I see you guys still using a lot of that same technique today. I mean, the, you know, uh, obviously Jeff Walker with his involvement uh, with the, the, the FXR Chaparral uh, team that Michael Lindsay has put together. I mean, even the riders today, these are a lot of these guys are guys that might not have the, the top of the leaderboard result, but man, they sure do have a lot of attention on them Monday through Friday via social and, and their video creation and their Instagram. Um, do you, is that something that even today you're, is that something you still take into consideration? Uh, what, what type of engagement does this athlete have? How are they going to represent my brand off the track as well as they are on the track? Or is that kind of how you started, but you've changed up your plan since then? No, that's still kind of the plan. Um, I'm kind of looking for the rider that, uh, you know, can send the big show, whether it be Supercross, Motocross, GNCC. Um, you know, they might not be the top dog at the Supercrosses, but when they go home, they're the guy. They're the main guy back in their place in Alabama, uh, Tennessee, wherever it would be, uh, they're the main guy. And uh, I feel that they bring a lot of attention to FXR 
because we're supporting these key privateers. It's no secret that I try to hire every LCQ winner possible <laughs> yeah. because they get so much TV time yeah. um, battling. And they're usually the guys that are on the end of each starting line where the camera is. And the camera will, will you know, pan across the guys from, from the beginning to the middle. And uh, we usually have a couple of XR guys there. And, um, you know, th there's a big jump in Supercross. Uh, you've got the privateer guys, the three-digit guys, and some of the guys two-digit with higher numbers that are just making it from weekend to weekend with paychecks and whatnot. And those are the guys that are hardcore and working really hard. I, I think they know they're not going to be Supercross champions, so their marketing skills of – have come out a little bit more. They're socially connected. They're great people. Um, and I like supporting them. Then there's the next level where you get up to guys. Um, you've got uh, uh, Tomax and Webs and whatever and all those guys. You know, they're big, big money. And um, I'm not ready to invest in a guy at that level today, maybe tomorrow. But um, that money that you invest in that one guy can go really far into a lot of privateers across the board, whether it be Supercross, Motocross, Arena Cross, GNCC, yeah. Works, Big Six, Sprint Enduro, National Enduro. There's so many high quality racing out there that there's no way I can sponsor everybody at top level, but I, I go and look at it and figure out which riders I feel is the best bang for the buck in social media, return investment, connecting, networking with people, getting dealers on board, and just the best of that. Sure. That makes me curious about the, uh, the Brock Tickle, uh, move. So obviously that was, that was a, a pretty exciting, uh, acquisition for you guys to get a rider like that. And, and I guess right time, right place, obviously him kind of cutting, coming back in and getting his career started again. Um, is give me whatever information you can, as far as the decision that went into that, because obviously Brock, if uh, what happened hadn't have happened, he, he's a guy that's at the very top of the sport that might be one of those Tomac like guys that would be hard for you to be able to afford, but the position he was in, he still had a lot of attention on him. He still has a lot of skill clearly, even though he, he unfortunately got injured again. Mm -hmm. Um, what was the strategy behind going after that rider acquisition? Well, you know, um, as I said, we, you know, maybe not today we'll have the top three or four guys, but we're always looking for an opportunity to maybe get in the top 10. Sure. And um, I knew Brock would be back this year. Um, I, I don't know Brock at all. I, I know of him. I, a lot of our FXR people connections know of Brock and I mentioned to a few people and they said, you know, Brock could be, I think they, he'd be into it. Let's, uh, let's start some dialogue. And I, I met up with him at uh, Ironman last year at the national and just a quick conversation, gave him my business card. Uh, he knew who we were. We talked a little bit and then we got onto a phone call a couple weeks later. And uh, I said, listen, uh, I want to get involved with you now. I want to start promoting you now and kind of follow the Brock tickle story all the way up to when you start racing. Um, you're going to be like one of my top, top guys. So I'm going to put a big investment in you for magazines, banner ads, whatnot. Um, get, uh, videos, YouTubes, whatever built around you. And he really liked that whole idea. And, uh, he, I, I feel that he, he's a very humble guy, which is nice. And he felt that, uh, you know, he was a bit of an underdog and, uh, he wasn't going to ask for crazy money because that's a little bit ridiculous when he's been out of the game for so long but i proposed a great strategy on uh on his salary on different levels from privateer to factory to results and he liked that program and um right away we connected and it worked out well and my whole strategy behind it was that i knew that a lot of people would be connected to brock uh, you know whether you you're with him or against him. It's a bit of a Cinderella story, him coming back from a two-year suspension. How will he do? Well, I know that he hasn't let off one bit. He trains like an animal. He works with a lot of key riders. He's totally engaged in it. And I knew coming out of the gate, he'd be a guy that uh, would be, you know, an eight to 12 kind of guy. And yeah. that's exactly what I was looking for. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I was personally excited when I saw that just because the, the, the marketing mind always being on, 
uh, I was like, man, that is an awesome acquisition because he's a top rider that probably doesn't have that top price tag currently. So I think that's, uh, that's an exciting one that I'm, I'm excited for him to come back, stay healthy, and then really see how, what that does, uh, not only for his career, but for, for the FXR brand, because I think it's an interesting acquisition and, and something that will pay off if we can just come back and stay healthy. Hey, we're going to take a quick break. We've got Andy White from FXR with us today on the Moto Marketing Podcast. We'll be right back to uh, talk to them more about how they've grown the brand. So stick with us. Hey, I want to tell you about our friends at MX Tech. They manufacture professional aftermarket suspension for riders who want excellent comfort and control. Their quality engineering is based on a lifetime of specializing in dirt bike suspension, and they've developed the Lucky Fork, which features dual springs, dual cartridges, huck valves, and is ultra lightweight. MX Tech utilizes the latest technology and coatings to deliver maximum performance while remaining the lightest shock available. Head over to MX hyphen tech.com for more information again that's mx hyphen tech.com for more information and tell them luke from the moto marketing podcast sent you All right, welcome back. We got Andy White with us from FXR, and, and we're talking about the, the the growth of the brand within the moto space. And uh, as we left off, obviously, you guys have acquired Brock Tickle. Uh, you've done a lot of work with privateers over the years. Um, something that I'm curious, and I think a lot of people watching and listening today would be curious as well, how does a brand like FXR go up against some of the just the giants in the gear uh, in protective space in, in the, in the sport that's been around for years that everybody knows. Um, what is there a specific strategy that you guys have? Because there are so many really small brands, um, that, that try, that have a pretty good product that try to do what you guys do, but they don't get to the level that you've gotten and you're at this level and you continue to grow. So how, how do we combat the giants of the space that have been around for years? Good question. Um, as we grow and we get into bigger, bigger events, some of these events have got sponsors that have been on board for a long, long time. And uh, they're not going anywhere away soon. Uh, Fly with Supercross, parts with GNCC, what not like that. So for me to break in, I have to wait for someone to drop out and for me to drop in. Um, so the only other way to tackle this is basically, um, work with, uh, key riders, working with social media, uh, working with building videos around our riders. I, I guess everything else I can do except having a logo on the track, right. a banner and being a, a corporate sponsor or a title sponsor of these rounds. It's, it's, it's a challenge. It's difficult. And like you said, the marketing mind is turning all the time, trying to figure out how to break into this program. and. I feel that we've done a great job of breaking in with the key riders, um, working with like Michael Lindsay's uh, Chaparral Honda team with his key riders. Uh, you know, people looked at me a little strange when I connected onto that program. And I know Michael Lindsay's, uh, you know, he was a competitor in the, in the media years ago. Um, he's got uh, some great resources and great ideas and he's really strong on social media and the riders he hired are also really good with Starling, Jerry, Walker, Chris Blows, Ben LeMay, Cody Shock. I mean, Chris Blows is probably the guy that could finish on the podium. The rest of them are all main night guys. Right. But the whole package to me is a great package because everybody's talking about the team, whether it's good or bad, everybody's talking about it. And, uh, in my view, if you're talking about it, it means you're getting some marketing out of it. And that was my strategy with him and some of the other teams. And uh, just working with key people, I feel, is where we've really made big steps forward. Um, you know, in, in, in riders, uh, we've got Mike Brown that's really helped us as a legend. 
um, racing still today, you know, racing at Loretta's, racing the Glen Helen four stroke, two stroke national, 125s. We got Kyle Chisholm, um, Chris Blows, uh, you know, guys that we had on, on board before, Jimmy D and Kyle Peters that have both uh, been on the podium in Supercross uh, uh, Lights Coast. So we've had a lot of TV coverage and uh, a lot of uh, success. So I, we're just growing and growing. and every day the phone rings or an email comes in that just gives us that new connection and then the next level. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting to, to see. Uh, I mean, going back to Michael Lindsay, everything that they've done over there to even where, I mean, it's been a pretty rough week for him week in and week out, uh, yeah. but his, his videos uh, and then uh, the, the Jerry Robbins videos, and then Jeff's going to be coming back for the outdoors. Like all of these guys are documenting and showcasing and there's so much curiosity around, Hey, how are these guys doing? Even when they do bad, they, I feel like they really fulfill their sponsorship duties as opposed to a guy that maybe doesn't make the main and you never see him on TV. And if you don't see him on TV, you don't see him anywhere else. And I think there's a, I, I've talked about this time and time again on this show, the importance of, these riders really understanding and the teams understanding how important um, what people like Michael are doing. And now you have Alex Martin doing it with his troll train vlog to where if you have a good night or a bad night on the track, obviously that's that, but you can still get a lot of exposure for the sponsors that it is what it is. They're the reason you're on the track. They're the reason that that financial uh, support is there is to get that exposure. So um, I feel like you keep going back to that, that that's something that you guys really look for is the attention and a lot of these guys have that online beyond influencer marketing with through the teams and their social, what are some other assets that you look to as an important piece of the marketing component from spo uh, uh, podcast sponsorships to, you know, print like racer X and online racer X and, and, and your, your Google marketing and social, do you, do you feel you have it pretty well-rounded or is there areas that you know, you're just, you could do a better job? I think we can all do better jobs uh you know we're juggling a lot of plates at the same time working with yeah. all the media outlets um podcasts um that's a good question uh you know i'm trying to get that fxr name that logo that brand into the front of as many people as i possibly can and it's uh it's funny i heard uh, the other day on a podcast um they were uh, promoting some helmets at a Supercross round and uh, a gentleman came up and had no idea that this new helmet was available and it's been around for the last year and that sales rep uh, was, uh, was, was like caught off guard that, that that person had no idea this helmet's been around and like, do you not look at magazines or go online or what? And the guy said, no, I don't really, but I'm an avid rider and uh, I ride with a lot of guys and I've never even seen it before and I'm like, man, there's another angle, another customer base to try and connect to, but how do you connect to these people? And there's only so many events that you can go to and, and show your product and spend that kind of money. And there's a point where you, you don't want to overspend and then if you overspend, then there's, there's no profit left to pay the bills. So you've got to balance it out from weekend to weekend and year to year, basically. So it's a challenge. And like I said, you, you look at the best avenues, the best return, word of mouth uh, from people that you know, from industry, uh, what works, what doesn't. And then you get all the data afterwards and then you can you know, look at it all and figure out, okay, what's working, what's not working. If that's not working, but you're still connected to really big influence people, then man, you still better spend money there. So it's, uh, it's, it's a tough one. It's, it's challenging and um, the way I see it is our sales are growing. Um, we're ordering more and more product, more dealers are calling, more riders are calling. We must be doing something right. Sure. Yeah. It, it's, it's funny. There's always that, that segment of a buyer, um, that they're hard to reach and even local small businesses have that too, to where, I mean, we're in Morgantown, West Virginia, where racer X headquarters is located and, you know, the local businesses have that same problem to where it's, they still do a lot of them do TV and radio, but how do you reach the person that just doesn't consume that because they're, they're they work on a farm or they work in the coal mines or something like that. How does the chiropractor reach them? So I feel like every segment, every market has that. And it's interesting that even in the moto space, you, you ride with guys that have the gear on, you, you go to the races and somehow you still don't see this super popular product. I think 
my approach or stand on it, it stance on it is you have to do everything you can do to reach that 80% of the market that's reachable. And then the 20 that maybe they do things a little unorthodox, they ride, but they consume no media. I think if the marketing is done well everywhere else, the word of mouth and everything like that eventually will get to those people. And, and that guy being at that race, seeing that product, that event activation activated that client. So um, yeah, it's definitely a, it's a, it's a tricky thing to figure out, but if you are omnipresent everywhere at once, which you guys have done a really good job of doing that, I feel like that's, that's the best approach is to try to be everywhere that you can be at once. Would you agree? It does also help that the product is uh, very well made and designed and colors are very catchy and writers are talking about that. Um, I, I get that feedback from a lot of people that, um, have never tried her stuff or seen it, but they've heard through like a Nicoletti or a Brown or uh, even our new guys on Sherco, Cody Webb, mentioning it to a rider, you know, man, this stuff is like the best stuff I've ever tried. You got to try it. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're paid for it. You know, you're paid, you're, you're making money. No, seriously. I, you know, Cody had a chance to sign with four or five or six different companies and wow. he, uh, he wanted to wear FXR and we're super pumped on him wearing FXR and, um, he's a great ambassador, a uh, great humble guy, and he's really helping us promote the brand in the off-road world. And that's a, a market that is absolutely massive grassroots. And, you know, some of our competitors have owned that market for a long, long time. And I was at the GNCC in Florida this past weekend. And, uh, you know, we were there counting every FXR rider to see who was wearing it and who wasn't. And it was interesting from last year to this year, how we've grown and talking to those riders on the starting line was impressive. Uh, you know, they really liked their product and uh, told us, you know, which product was their favorite, uh, what glove fit the best, what pant they liked the best. And it was really good feedback. Um, uh, and another angle that we try to do is uh, like mini O's and stuff like that, where we bring riders like Mike Brown to, and you know, a legend like Mike down on the starting line in the staging area, standing there and these vet riders that look up to him are scared to death of him on the track, but they look up to him and they come over and start chatting with him. And Mike, you know, he, he, he might look like that intimidator number three, like I say, the Earnhardt with the helmet on, but when he's got the helmet off, he's a really humble and easygoing guy and he'll talk to anybody and everybody. And he, he enjoys that uh, talk, but uh, watch out on the track, you know, he's, that's right. That's right. He's the guy. But, you know, it was incredible watching him work with uh, these vet riders and their kids and whatnot at Loretta's and Minio's. And I thought, man, this is a great opportunity uh, to connect to guys. So I'm currently looking for lots of Mike Browns around the country to help us promote the product. So at the time of recording this, uh, Villapoto was just on Pulp MX this past week. And I'm, I'm sure you heard and you probably know what I'm going to talk about. He, he had mentioned that his gear deal is up in, in August. And you know how Ryan's always that guy that's looking for the next way he's going to make, make that dollar. Um, it, would, would a Villapoto be th – this sport's interesting because you can go after these retired riders and still put your branding – on them and it's still as valuable as somebody that's in their prime like Mike Brown. I mean, it, that, that is super intriguing to me. Would you guys have interest in going after a, a Villapoto or something like that as well? Or uh, is it more of the kind of, you know, the, the hometown guy type of a feel like Mike Brown? Cause they are very different brands. They are very different. Um, Mike Brown was at the top of the game at one time and now he is in amateur racing and he's riding a ton um, training. He wants to ride more this year than he did last year, uh, which is crazy. He's going to be 48 years old in a couple weeks. And uh, he just wants to keep on going and going. And he's racing against guys that are 30, 25 at, at Loretta's and mini O's. And, you know, it's just incredible. He's got uh, the passion. So I'm looking for guys like Mike Browns. Um, you know, the Villa Potos is a different opportunity, business opportunity you really have to weigh the opportunities. You know, how much money does it cost to sign a Villapoto? What will he be doing for you in return? Um, so there's a bit of a balance there, you know, uh, always open to discussion. You never know what could happen with an opportunity like that. I, I'm sure Villapoto's price tag probably hasn't dropped much since his racing days from what I can gather, but Hey, you never know. It could work out. I'm sure it hasn't. Uh, you know, he's still a legend and yeah, absolutely. a great following. Yeah. people you know look up to him and he still rides really hard and 
Uh, he's on a lot of shows. So, you know, he's definitely got some value to him. No doubt. So, Andy, as we kind of wrap things up, what, what's the best way for somebody that wants to learn more about the FXR brand, the FXR product? Where, where can we, we follow you on social and then uh, learn more about the product online? Well, you can go to our website, fxrracing.com, to see all the different products. You'll see our YouTube channel there. You'll see a media section up in the top right of the website um, where you'll see reports from our races of where we've been and a lot of our athletes that compete for us on social media, Instagram. You can go to FXR Moto. Um, that basically uh, shows you all our riders uh, around the world. Um, you know, I didn't mention it, but uh, this year we signed up a, a, a solid GP rider, Sean Simpson. Oh, wow. Who, uh, you know, he crushed it in Moto2 last week in, in England. Uh, he finished fourth, um, actually battled with Caroli the whole moto and passed him halfway through the moto and started pulling away. And uh, we're so pumped on having Sean on the program to develop our European uh, market, which is actually very, very strong with us, uh, very strong right now because of the FXR Snow brand that has built that program out in, in Scandinavia and areas that and uh you know the uk market german market is all starting to take off right now and uh like i said uh, we can't build gear fast enough for some of those countries right now and uh forecasting is a nightmare that damn crystal ball does not work at all every time i try to talk to it it okay. gives me a different answer so it's it's very very interesting um but uh yeah i mean if you punch an fxr into uh and to Google, I'm sure you'll find lots of uh, lots of stories and lots of interesting stuff on uh, FXR. Absolutely. Are you going to be at any more of the Supercross races or any of the nationals on your schedule? Definitely. Uh, you know, Las Vegas uh, will be one. Salt Lake will be uh, another one. I just got back from Florida. We did Daytona. We did the Tampa uh, Mini Supercross on Thursday. We did the GNCC. And then we went back for the Ricky Carmichael Amateur Day. So uh, Brad, my athlete manager, and I basically, I think we walked uh, 70,000 steps between the three events, meeting people and talking to people. Um, it was uh, quite, uh, quite incredible. But uh, yeah, uh, Brad will be at uh, all the events coming up. Uh, we have a lot of riders to support, and uh, we want to support these privateers the best way we can. Uh, same with the GNCC events. We have a guy named Kyle Wolf that... Uh, attends these events and does a great job of supporting our riders and we have an athlete manager in Europe that attends all the GPs and world enduro events um, so we've got key people all over the place really pushing the name and branding and uh, networking and uh, we're not letting off the, the throttle at all we're, we're going to push hard. Yeah, it's an exciting time for, for FXR for sure. So, I mean, I definitely encourage everybody to check it out on, uh, on their social channels. Um, check out their riders too. I think that's a really good um, uh, place for people to learn more about the brand because uh, you guys have done a great job of positioning your brand with, with, with riders that are relatable and fun that people can get to know, like, and trust online. So be sure to check out their athletes, check them out uh, on, on their site. We'll put that all in the show notes for you guys. And uh, Andy, I appreciate you joining us today, man. It was a pleasure talking to you. No, thank you. Uh, a lot of fun. Uh, looking forward to uh, the future of FXR and working with Racer X and all these, you know, other media companies. And uh, uh, I forgot to mention, we have the Baylor brothers on the Sherco program this year. And, uh, those two brothers, uh, man, they're full entertainment. They have a great following, GNCC, and uh, awesome. they've really moved the needle on uh, on our program for off road as well. Very cool. So be sure to check those guys out on uh, on social as well. Well, man, we appreciate it, and we will uh, we'll be catching up soon. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to the Moto Marketing Podcast. If your goal is to get real, measurable results from your marketing that will grow your company revenue, then check out how Impact Media can get the same results that they have for Moto's most iconic brands by visiting thinkimpact.com. That's T-H-I-N-K-I-M-P-A-K-T.com. Have a marketing question that you want answered on the show? Send your questions to questions at motomarketingpodcast.com. Don't forget to rate review and subscribe to the podcast and we'll catch you on the next episode of the moto marketing podcast